Hello everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Homeopathic Super Sessions by Dr. Jagos. Today I'll be doing the third chapter by Carol Dunham, that is relationship of pathology to therapeutics. The question of relationship of pathology to therapeutics is of prime importance. The science of therapeutics is based on its general principles and its special application is based upon the facts of pathology. So out here, we are using the general principles, but we are taking into account the special application of pathology to the general principles, hence it becomes important. It becomes necessary to know the definitions of certain terms which are used again and again with regard to this topic. So in this chapter, Carol Dunham will repeatedly tell you the different terms which are used again and again. So hence, the definitions are of importance. So now let us familiarize ourselves with these terminologies or the definitions, that is function of the organ, physiology, physiological anatomy, morbid physiology, pathology and pathological anatomy. So now let us see one by one the definitions of each of them. So functions of an organ, it is the act of performing special work of organs or tissues of the healthy body. And functions can be only be ascertained on the living organ. So that is quite simple. It is the functions of the organ is that each specific organ in our body has specific functions in, in the state of health. So therefore we have to ascertain that. Physiology, it can be defined as the science of phenomena of normal life. So physiology deals with normal life. In other words, it is a science of function of the healthy living organism. So everything what is to be uh, said or done with the healthy living organism will be in relationship to the physiology. It is a performance of special work done by many organs in harmony with each other, which constitutes the living body. So naturally, in the phenomena of normal life, whatever special functions organs are doing, they are doing it in harmony with each other. So therefore, health has been maintained. Physiological anatomy, it is a functioning of normal organs or tissues in a state of health. In other words, it is a study of healthy tissues and organs of the body. So in physiological anatomy, we are studying the organs and the healthy tissues in the healthy state of the body. It can be seen upon the living, it can be seen upon the living or the dead body, provided that death has not death has resulted from violence and not from disease. So you can also study it on the dead body, provided this is important, provided death has resulted from violence and not from disease. So if some sort of an accident, accident is there, that is a violent incidence. So after the person dies, you can then study the physiological anatomy and it is not from a disease condition. Morbid physiology, it deals with the beginning of abnormal functions or organs or tissues in a living organism. So now we are shifting from the normal to the abnormal. So morbid physiology, it is the beginning of abnormal functions or organs or tissues in a living organism. So whatever abnormal functions are there, we consider this as the morbid physiology. So there's a deviation from the normal health to the abnormal health of the normal to the abnormal, from health to the disease, from equilibrium to disequilibrium. Pathology, it can be defined as the science of phenomena of disease of or abnormal life. So pathology deals with the phenomena of disease or anything which is abnormal or abnormal life. It deals with abnormal or pervertive functions seen in the tissues or organs of the body when the disease sets in. So naturally, when the disease sets in, the harmony is disturbed, the equilibrium is disturbed, and there comes a state of a disease condition wherein the functions also are disturbed or they are abnormal or they get perverted. In simple terms, it is abnormal functions of the, of the disease living body. So in simple terms, in one sentence, we can say that pathology is nothing but the abnormal functions which is present or which is seen in the disease living body. Pathological anatomy, it is a change brought about by disease condition which causes structural change in the organs or tissues of the body. In other words, it is the science of morbid tissue and organs of the disease body. Regarding pathology, one will attain a correct notion of the subject by knowing the scope, limitations, and the relation of the science of pathology. So this is an important point which Carol Dunham wants to tell you that 
regarding pathology one must attain a special knowledge about the subject so your subject of pathology should be perfect you must know its scope and its limitations that is also very important because this will help you to take up the case or leave the case in homeopathy and naturally its, its, its relations of the science of pathology dr carpenter defines the object of physiology as the phenomena of health or normal life so another gentleman dr carpenter he also says the same thing that physiology is nothing but the phenomena of health or normal life However, the object is not life itself, but the phenomena which depends upon and results from normal life. So therefore he says that the object is not life itself, but it is results from the phenomena which results from the normal life. So basically, what are we seeing? We are seeing in the universe, the universal life force is there and that, and that is then projected onto all the living things on the earth, that is the animals, the plants, and the, best, and the best example is the human being. So therefore he says, Dr. Carpenter says, however, the object is not life itself, but the phenomena which depends upon and results from normal life. Walchow is of the opinion that self is a unit of life and it is in the seat of, the, of real vital action. So Walchow is saying that each cell is a unit of life and each cell has its real vital action. Every animal presents itself as a sum of vital unities which manifests the characteristics of life. So even he says that every animal, which is also a, a, a living entity, it also, it is, a, it is nothing but an sum of vital entities that or vital unities, that is the different cells, which manifest the characteristic of life. Dr. Carpenter's opinion that the cells live for itself and is dependent upon the supply of proper nutrition and proper temperature for the continuance of its growth and proper functions. It will cease when life expires. So Dr. Carpenter further adds that the cell will go on living provided it gets a proper nutrition and it gets a proper term temperature for its continuance of its growth and proper functions. And moment something abnormal occurs or the proper supply of nutrition and proper temperature is not there to the cells, the person will die. So therefore he says it will cease when life expires. Dr. J. H. Burnett says that nutrition is the inherent vital property which are peculiar to the tissues themselves. So Dr. J. H. Bennett, he also says that the nutrition is an inherent vital property which makes the tissues live and they function properly. They exist at the same time a force of attractiveness and selectiveness. So this is also important. He says that the exercise in health at the same time, a force of attractiveness and selective. That means what? Whatever, uh, whatever uh, nutrients are essential, it will attract it. And again, it will be selective. It will only select those nutrients which are required by the tissue or the organ. Therefore, the attractiveness and selectiveness is, will be there. Thus, to sum it up, the organism is a complex which can be analyzed into aggregation of cells of a homogeneous structure each one being endowed with a particular inherent vital power of attraction and selection. So therefore he says that if you sum it up, in short, the human organism, is, it's, it is a complex entity and it is built up of an aggregation of cells which are of a homogeneous structure and each one of them are being, are, they have a peculiar inherent power of attraction and selection, which I've just told you. So physiology concerns with the result of life, which I already told you, and pathology will concern with the result of the disease. It has to be remembered that the subjects of anatomy and physiology are not life, but only the, it is only at the result of life. The science of pathology and pathological anatomy are not disease itself, but only the result of disease. Hence this distinction, if properly perceived, will have a direct and important bearing upon the science of therapeutics, which has its object to cure the disease. Now let us take into account the fact of urination. So now let us see something about the physiological process, which I will describe in this chapter. The pathological process will be described in part two. So now let us take into account the fact of urination. As so far the observer is concerned, it is a discharge of urine from the urethra and emptying of the urinary bladder. So as far for a lay person or for an observer, the fact of urination is nothing but the discharge or elimination of the urine from the urethra and as a result of which 
the urinary bladder is empty or there's emptying of the urinary bladder as a result of which there's a discharge of urine from the urethra. The physiological process shows that it is a complex mechanism and carries through several series of phenomena before we arrived at the ultimate fact. But however, if you go into the physiological aspect of it, of urine formation, naturally it is a complex mechanism. And we see that there are several pathways or several reactions which are there, which will uh, which take place in the kidney before the urine can be eliminated. If you trace the urine through its reservoir, the bladder, up to the ureters, to the tubules of the kidney. So I said, now let us trace the, uh, the, uh, the point of urination. That means what? From the bladder, it goes up to the ureters and then into the kidneys. We see that it has received a great portion of its watery constituents. But still, it requires further explanation by the mechanical laws of endosmosis and exosmosis. That is, whatever the cell requires the, uh, the nutrient, it, it absorbs it, and whatever it doesn't require, it rejects it, whereby the constituents were separated from the blood. The Malpighian bodies eliminate the other constituents of urine from the blood, including urea, through the agency of the cell wall. So through the cell wall and by the Malpighian bodies, that is the glomerulus, that is the glomerula, the afferent and the efferent tubules, which form the Malpighian bodies, they are they will eliminate the constituents from the urine, including the urea. Although the Malpighian bodies separate the urea from the blood, yet they do not manufacture it from the constituents of that fluid. It is found to be already formed as per the analysis of physiological effect of urination. This would lead to the study of nutrition and decay of nitrogenized tissues. The cell wall of these should first meet with the ultimate vital act in which all the processes which involve urination revolves around life. So this is very important that the cell wall with, with the process of end osmosis and exosmosis that will help to, uh, to filter, out, filter out all the products and then finally the urine will be passed. So the cell wall of this should be first meet with the ultimate vital act in which all processes which involve urination revolves around life. It is pure, simple and mystifying. Thus, physiology goes somewhat further than the analysis of normal function of the living organism. It throws light on not merely the process of living organism, but also contributes towards the science of pathology. So that's all in this part. So now in the second part, we will see something more about it or the next point of it. So thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much.